Welcome, everyone, to episode two of the 1700 versus Master Analysis. In today's video, I'm going to go over a game played by Gary Kasparov and uh, Alexei Shirov in 1994, I think this game was played. Um, and then we're going to compare my analysis as a 1700 rated player with that of Daniel Naroditsky, a grandmaster and one of the internet's best chess teachers, uh, his analysis of the game. So let's get started here. Um, we have... Kasparov with the white pieces and Sharov with the black pieces. Kasparov plays e4. Okay, so we see a Sicilian c5. And then knight f3. Um, so yeah, right off the bat, because I don't play e4 much nowadays, but um, I personally play the delayed Alapin, so I'm expecting something like d5, takes, takes. Um, or the, uh, what is this again? Mikhail Tal played this a lot. Uh, Kasparov apparently. Anyways, takes takes. All I know is that this is all standard. Like this position is standard. We're definitely still in theory here. And here is where I have not seen, <clears throat> not only because I haven't played this myself, not only because I don't play this line myself, but uh, even looking at other like master games and stuff, I don't know if I've seen this move before. So this is interesting. Kasparov is avoiding that trade, which still would probably be fine the knights are protecting each other and then obviously i guess the knight the knight on um b5 is just eyeing those two uh you know the d6 and the uh c7 squares not maybe right away but well actually there there's the threat of knight knight d6 check um and then if bishop takes queen takes and that could be that could be a little bit annoying so all right, so Shrav plays d6, stopping that threat. Um, Bishop f4, just adding some more pressure to that d6 pawn. Uh, and then e5. So a couple of things to notice here, I think, is that e5 obviously shuts that, shuts that bishop down to just further protect that d6 square. Um, but also it's weakening the d5 square. So, you know, jumping the knight to d5 is impossible right away because then knight takes e4. But just to keep an eye on like that, <clears throat> that hole on d5 now, I'm guessing either bishop back to e3 maybe or bishop to g5. I don't really know here. Bishop g5. Okay, and we don't see, for example, like bishop e7. Uh, Sharav immediately kind of contest that knight kicks it out of there um seems like a pretty good move too because like i'm curious where this knight's going if it if it's going back to a3 looks okay but a little bit awkward um and obviously he can't take so knight back to a3 and then b5 is threatening a fork so we'll have to address that um one thing i notice is that this diagonal is now a little bit tender. Uh, maybe Shrav is looking to Fienketo with the bishop. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I'm white, I'd be looking at these backward pawns now that could potentially be weak if you could stick like a stick a piece on the d5 square and then go hunting after that d6 pawn somehow, or just enjoy that those nice squares. But yeah, Kasparov needs to um, address this threat. So he plays knight d5, which is actually works because this knight is pinned now. So that, now we see the reasoning, I think part of the reason that Kasparov played uh, bishop g5 to pin that knight because it means that this um, e4 pawn is protected by tactics. So he cannot take and he's adding some more pressure on that knight. Bishop b7 makes sense, kind of the only move that gets out of that. And then bishop takes knight. Okay, bishop takes f6. And I'm guessing that Kasparov is not going to be taking that bishop because that's a pretty nice knight there on uh, d5. Instead, we see c3. Right away, it looks like he's just restricting some of the knight's movements, um, that knight on c6. And then potentially opening up a square for his own knight to jump to c2 and reroute, maybe. Like, this would look pretty... This would actually look pretty nice right there on e3, I, I think. All right. So we see bishop b7. Okay. Knight's rerouting to c2. And one thing to note, too, is that this b5 is stopping the bishop from coming out and adding some more protection. Um, so we'll see where Kasparov puts the light squared bishop. 
but e2 for me e2 looks like the best square okay so he immediately moves the knight back and puts some pressure on that knight on e on d5 so i think that's a pretty important piece Kasparov ignores that and plays a4, which makes some sense. Uh, pushing to b4 doesn't work at all because that's just a free pawn. It's not even like threatening to ruin white's pawn structure. So that looks like a pretty good move. And then we see takes, rook takes, and then knight d7. Um, <clears throat> could be maybe looking at knight, b, uh, knight b6. Forking the knight and the rook, so kind of forcing that knight and then developing the queen. Rook, I don't know, maybe rook b4 is possible. Just to add some pressure, but that might not be a good move. One thing to notice, too, is that there is this pressure on the a6 pawn. Um, so maybe Kasparov will end up going after that. And we do see rook b4 hitting the bishop. Knight c5. Um, so knight c5 hits the e4 pawn and protects the bishop on b7. Can't be easily kicked out of there, otherwise that would be a blunder, because you could just like, you know, for example, attack the knight with the pawn and then win the bishop, but that's not possible. Whoa, okay. <laughs> that is not what I was expecting. So Kasparov sacks the rook, sacks the exchange on b7, knight takes b4 um trying to find the reasoning and the compensation for this i guess removing that bishop does take away one of the attackers from the knight on d5 so that knight is definitely pretty strong other than that like it also frees up the b5 square so the bishop is a little bit freer to come out here maybe i don't know if that's a good move necessarily but okay and then we get bishop uh g5 just looks like a better diagonal maybe he's looking to actually play f5 or use that f pawn in some way but also this bishop doesn't really make any it's a terrible piece right there on f6 i think so this just um activates the bishop further kasparov plays knight a3 probably looking to reroute i'm guessing to c4 castles knight c4 this is probably going to hurt if that happens. Okay, a5, that makes sense. But Kasparov ignores it. So he takes back with a pawn. Uh, this is a pass pawn. So that might actually be what he, what Kasparov's going for here. Those knights are going to be very annoying. <clears throat> and then I'm guessing Kasparov wants to castle soon here. But not yet. So we see a4, sorry, h4, looks like a really accurate move, actually. And then bishop back to h6, that makes sense. Stay on that diagonal. Knight, b, knight b6 hits the rook. Rook down to a2, makes sense. Threatening even something like this, I don't know, he's just got a rook on the second rank, so. And then we see castles. Uh, there is also this fork, but I'm assuming because, like, Shirav is already up the exchange. Um, maybe he doesn't matter too much giving back some material for a positional advantage. Because, like, okay, so first he's going to throw in, Shirav throws in rook d2, like I was saying, uh, which forks the queen and the bishop, but the queen can come out maybe to d3 or to f3 to protect the bishop. Looks like he goes to f3. Um. Okay, Kasparov, or sorry, Sharov moves the queen out of the way from that fork, putting a little bit of pressure, I guess, on that knight. Um, and then we see knight d7 from Kasparov. Yeah, the knights are working the way over to the king side. Um, the bishop is kind of bad, I would say, but and then we still have this pass pawn. If I had to guess, I mean, I don't know who would be winning here, but I might actually... Surprisingly enough, I might actually think white is winning already because of that pass pawn and the act of knights. Knight back to d8. So maybe the knight looks to be rerouting because it just doesn't have any possibilities over here. So maybe it's rerouting to e6 and then probably... Aha. e6, d4 is what I'm looking at. 
He grabs the rook. Oh yeah, and I didn't even notice that, so that full-on just gives back the rook. So he sacks the exchange, gets the king, like, just getting ready to come on out. Um, b5, so this pass pawn does look like that's what Kasparov is kind of playing off of. Looks like it's potentially pretty dangerous. Um, and it is protected on the b6 square, so he can actually keep pushing that, and then we'll have to find a way to... Uh, Push it to that b7 square, maybe the rook over to b1. Alright, but Sharav plays queen a3, immediately putting more pressure on that bishop. I'm assuming Kasparov already saw this. Maybe he'll just trade. Uh okay, yeah. This must be there's a reason why this why uh Naroditsky took this game from Kasparov. He sacks the bishop. And I don't entirely see why just yet. Maybe queen, he's threatening queen d7. Queen d7, and then that would be mate, right? If he's able to get in um, queen e7 check, king over, and then um, queen e8 mate. But also it's protecting that pawn and I guess getting ready to maybe push that further? I don't know. I don't think... Well, it could also be... Looking at taking on h7, and then here would be mate as well, because the knight's covering the escape the escape square. Okay, so he does not take the free bishop. Uh, wow. Because now takes, the king escapes. Bishop moves out of the way. Still loose, though. That bishop can be attacked, but it's protecting the knight. And then rook c2, hitting the bishop. This check is available if you wanted it. Um, he takes on h7, so he's going on a king hunt, it looks like. Sacks the bishop. Wow. Wow. This is a fork. Shira okay, so this is one thing that kind of surprises me, is that... I'm thinking he should have seen that after, if he takes the bishop, so after queen takes, takes h7, he grabs the bishop, but then he knows that this check is available, right? So queen, um, queen g8 check, he knows that the king has only one square to go to and that it's forkable, so actually I don't know what the time control was, but that would kind of surprise me that he didn't see that, but maybe it was the best, best option for black, I'm not really sure. The queen is kind of awkward here now, too, because, like, literally has no way out. The king is protecting the knight and that um, f7 pawn that he would like to get, so the queen for now is literally going to have to go back to h7 and then evacuate, like, anyways. Okay, so queen c5 hits the knight, rook a1. Not threatening, not, not threatening a7 check for the moment, but just grabbing that open file. The king is pretty safe, actually, it looks like. Queen d4 hits the rook, forks the knight and the uh, rook, actually. Wow. Kasparov sacks the knight. Why? How does this work? <laughs> so, like, if takes, check. The king is forced down, and then we can grab the knight. And that is looking kind of scary for black's king. This doesn't seem like it would be doable, but... Sharav must see whatever threat there is, because he does not take that knight. Instead, plays bishop uh, bishop c1, hitting the rook. Sorry, whoops. What? Knight e3. There has to be a mating net here. He'd be forced either down to e6, and then it looks like e8 would be mate. Oh, yeah, so he can't take... I'm sorry, if the bishop takes, we have the knight, knight fork right away, forking the king and the queen. But yeah, Shrav just resigned here. So let's take a look at Naroditsky's evaluation. The internet's best chess teacher. And I'm going to be right next to him. Uh, one of hey, Daniel. In which Kasparov beat GM Alexei Shurov, um, who of course was also one of the world's top players in the Turn 1990s. The volume up you can see 2740, which by those standards was insanely high um, and more meaningful than it is today. So we have a Sveshnikov, which begins as a E6 Sicilian, but transposes into a Sveshnikov. Now the Sveshnikov is an opening which has existed actually much longer than people realize. 
It was first played in the year 1883, which is actually quite odd when you think about it. Black weakens the D5 square. You know, in the 19th century, they were, were a lot less keen on violating principles of this sort. So it's actually impressive that so many players caught on to this. So we drop the knight back to a3. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with um, with some of the theory here. Black goes b5, and in return for the for the d5 square, black gets a lot of counterplay. And this counterplay comes into various types. First of all, there's a threat of b4. Um, this knight on a3 is excommunicated. And eventually, what usually tends to happen is that after a trade occurs on f6, as you'll see, black will move the bishop away from f6, where it will appear. Um, in fact, let's see the next couple of moves. Knight to d5, bishop e7, bishop f6, bishop f6. And one of black's ideas is to move this bishop away and then to go to f5, opening up the f-file. And a lot of Sveshnikov games has, have been won when white gets too enamored um, with that square on d5 and forgets that black has very significant play on the yeah we mentioned pushing uh, that f pawn uh, connected with this f5 move so it's a very very theoretical opening white has a million different ways to play it and kasparov plays the main line the most fashionable move of the time c3 and the idea of c3 is well there's a couple of ideas it controls the d4 square mainly it prepares to evacuate this knight from the edge of the board with knight c2 after which white can then undermine black's Pawn wedge with a4. So that's sort of a very standard set of moves. And that's exactly what happens. Sherov develops his dark light squared bishop. Kasparov goes knight c2. This is still very much extremely theoretical. And Sherov goes knight to b8, which is actually still remains a, very, a relatively popular move. Uh, but I think back then was the main line. And black extends the pressure on the knight on d5. The knight from c6. Uh, 2b8 can then go to d7, where it at least, you know, it does a couple of things. It can later go to c5 and attack e4. It can also go to b6 uh, and contest the knight on d5. So it's definitely a lot better placed and not in the way as the knight on c6 would be. So this move knight b8, one of those GM moves that actually is a lot more understandable than it looks. So Kasparov goes a4, um, as we, you know, uh, which is the main line, undermining the pawn. Sure, has to take, and Kasparov takes with a rook. There's still over 150 games in this position. Uh, so now Kasparov sure was one of the first high level games to go into this line. Um, and it was played a couple of times previously by GMs, uh, but not too many times. So this was relatively unexplored territory already by both players. Now sure of, well, what to do? He goes knight d7, improving the position of his knight. And Kasparov goes rook to b4. Uh, and we are about to enter the main uh, part of this game, the moment that made this game very, very famous. Okay, so rook b4 was played. Kasparov was the highest rated player. Was it a novelty at the time this game was played? Let me check. So it was, I don't believe a novelty. Oh, chess space can be stupid sometimes. Oh god. Okay, so Technical we see difficulties. Rook before had been played three times before Kasparov played it. Uh, most prominently by Patrick Wolf, um, who was former US champion, now lives in San Francisco, a good friend of mine, Grandmaster. He played it against an early computer, uh, actually. So it was sort of kind of a novelty. Um, and one very interesting thing that uh, you guys should be aware of. Uh, at high level chess, novelties are very big. When you manage to produce a novelty, that means you were the first person, obviously, to play a certain move. Um, and novelties can earn you a lot of currency in terms of being considered one of the sort of leading opening theoreticians. The people who are considered opening trailblazers are those who are able to come up with new moves in previously explored positions. Let's skip ahead and there's always this sort of little bit because great. this is a 26 Just minute long video it. and uh, he says lots of interesting but stuff. I, but, I, I, oh boy. Uh, bringing his knight as we discussed to a good square okay. and so, simultaneously attacking the bishop. And the novelty, I believe, amazing. And Kasparov's next move was still not a novelty. It had been played 
twice before by players who were not very strong, which tells me that they were correspondence players. Now, my question to you, and this is what made this game famous, what did Kasparov play? And mainly, what is the idea of this move that he played? Yeah, king e2 is a little bit over the top. Which we'll go through, um, because it does, suppose that if he a check. What? So somehow white is holding on to this line, but I don't even think No, it's not what he played, that's... Black... So they're getting to rook takes. Rook takes no, on b7. Kasparov was the first to play. Kasparov was the first, in fact. I sorted it by year. No, he was not. Did you and I have Bayern? A 1900 played this move. Trying to figure out if Kasparov was the first player to move. Positional but... sacrifice to a lot of club players uh, is very sort of mystical, and it might seem very foreign. And Kasparov does indeed follow up with b4. Now, I'm not going to pretend that positional sacrifices are easy to understand or they're not very hard to execute properly. But they are more understandable than some people realize. Because, so the move before, yeah, it, the main idea is to restrict. The knight on b7 is completely out of the game. Permanently. We noticed um, that. I noticed that not b4 is taking away those the game, it's gonna have to somehow squares. Maneuver through d8, which is currently occupied by the queen. And even on e6, it's not doing much. So that knight is going to be a problem piece for a very long time. The second thing that Kasparov accomplishes is he gets control permanently of lights, and this is truly permanent, of light squares. He eliminates Black's light squared bishop, so now... There's that too that I did not notice. I'll pause the video really quick. Uh, I didn't point out that, that that was the light squared bishop, and, um, you know, the dark squares are somewhat close, like it's less ideal, uh, I suppose. Like the bishop here on, when it comes to g5, controls this diagonal, but, um, well, anyways, white now has control over the light squares, so on d5 but the bishop once it comes out to let's say c4 is going to dominate completely on the light squares which not might not seem important right now but it's going to be important moves down the line that is the essence of a positional sacrifice is you judge that whatever you're sacrificing for is going to eventually become important uh, perhaps more important than it appears now some of you may be wondering what happens if a5 trying to undermine the spawn on b4 well there is no need to move the spawn in fact, you can give a check on b5, the king has to move. Mm. Now you can drive this bishop into c6. I mean, this already looks very nasty. And then, in the simplest is, I think, just a castle. And white is, I mean, you can just visually see the complete domination. Yeah, I would actually prefer yeah, white's no position control. hands down. So if you wanted to liberate this knight on b7, you could go queen d7. But you can't do that either because there's the possibility of knight b6 with a fork. Um, so Shirov is reduced to playing on the other side of the board. He goes bishop g5, which is a very understandable move. I explained the idea of this move previously. Black is eventually trying to prepare the move f5 after castling. And here Gasparov continues to play in very inspired fashion. His next two moves are the product of identifying his worst placed piece and improving it, um, but improving it in a very sort of creative way. There is a piece he has that's not doing anything. And you might say, well, it's the bishop, but the bishop can be easily developed later. There is a piece that's, you know, that's not doing anything, and you would kind of urgently like to involve it. Um, and that is the knight on c2. So where do we actually put that knight? Where did he actually, where did he go? I think he went where to... Where do we lead that knight? He went to a3, right? a3 and then to c4. So knight c3 allows black to take. You don't want to, you don't want to trade too many yeah, that pieces Yeah, that looks here. bad. Transit point. So he goes knight um, a3. To c4, where the knight will park itself, applying further pressure on the d6, but restricting black's position even further, and it'll, it will be sort of well defended by the bishop. Um, and I don't think this is the only move. I think something like this here. I'm pretty sure that Kaspar factored in, which we're for, and sure of goes a5, continuing to try to open the position up and get space uh, and literally air for his pieces. Now, obviously, Kasparov does not react to that, which would be an unthinkable positional mistake. That would lead, allow black to come to c5, which is exactly what you're trying to avoid, not to mention sort of hand the pass pawn to black. So Kasparov ignores it with bishop d3. That's a very important skill, by the way, just to ignore what your opponent is doing, not react to it. Yeah. Uh, and it's also important to point out, if Shurov goes a4, and tries to bank on his past pawn, what does white now have? Um, and this shows the magic of Kasparov's like he has a fork, like maybe knight b6, forking uh, the rook in the pawn. To employ your pieces for maybe. 
crucial tasks that kind of crop up all of a sudden. So what do we do? Mm -hmm. So we give a fork skis. And we pick off this pawn, or we take the rook, both of which are disastrous. There's no way for the, either loses for the rook sure or the queen. Opening up he tries to or add more to protection to the pawn. Okay. I mean, Obviously he can't. We take. Now, Not notice really. that the knight is still completely restricted. Sure, it goes queen b8. Um, what is the purpose of this move? Uh, again, I've seen this game before, but it's been a long time. So it's like I'm looking at these moves for the first time as well. And I'm not an, well, you might say I'm a prophet, but I'm really not. I'm, I'm sort of honestly looking at it too. Now, what I think he's trying to do uh, is actually leave space for the knight to go to d8 and then to e6 and, and to d4. I agree with you. Yeah, exactly. So he's also eyeing this b4 pawn and saying, okay, you know, if white ever moves the knight, the queen might be able to take it. Uh, very understandable. And it may seem like things are spiraling out of control, but Kasparov senses that he needs to act with a lot of urgency. Um, although he has positional domination, he doesn't have forever. And that's also a very important thing to remember. If Shirov eventually gets his knight to f4 and trades the knight on d5, White's compensation could very well evaporate. So Kasparov begins to take immediate action uh, to stir things up before Shirov is able to unwind. And he starts with the move h4, chasing the bishop away. Understandable. The bishop drops back to h6. Now Kasparov activates further the knight on c4 and jumps out to b6. Shirov responds by moving his rook to a2. And now I actually think is a very instructive moment, which can be used as a lesson. A lot of players looking at this position would spend a couple of seconds, and then they would play a move relatively quickly. Which move is tempting for white? It's the fork. I think the fork on d7 that we pointed out. Yes, knight d7. <clears throat> knight d7 is very tempting because it's a fork, but that is a false hope because after queen a7, you're actually helping black. Now, here's the point I want to make. Sometimes even if you were to win the rook, it would still not be that good. But here, you can't even take the rook because of checkmate, so you actually helped black activate his pieces. Yeah, I didn't spot that checkmate red, threat. Very measured move castles, eliminating all tactical threats. Okay, but he castles now, first. He's completely wiped the slate clean, and he can fully focus on using his knights and his positional superiority to his advantage. Rook d2 by Shurov. He's trying to stir things up, but now Kasparov jumps to f3, defending the bishop. You can see that Shurov's rook is annoying, but it's kind of stranded and it's operating alone, so it's not really creating anything, and after queen a7, which Shira plays anyway, Gasparov jumps out onto the final invasion here. Knight to d7. Look at how this knight has maneuvered from c from a3 to c2, then back to a3 to c4 to b6 and to d7, and at each transit point, it has achieved something specific. We've seen that a um, lot, like in the last, in the first episode uh lots of knight jumps lots of knight maneuvering um lots of like positional play where you know it looks like this is what you see certainly much less at my level um where you know you spot one weak square and then you see you know a knight start maneuvering around the board usually someone ends up blundering like a tactical blundering a pawn or a whole piece or you know something before you even have time to do those kinds of things but um just something to point out we see a lot of those knight maneuvers sometimes it's more than five six moves from the same piece seven it is attacking the rook and if the rook moves now we have what i think is a relatively straightforward decisive invasion of the other knight and here i'm pretty sure that there's probably multiple ways to win you could fork with knight c6 but queen takes f7 just intuitively ah it looks like it wins and if you take the bishop there is i think a quite a beautiful Crushing blow. Ah, very, very nice. I mean, this is a, actually kind of a typical idea if you solved a lot, but it's nice. Knight f8. It produces a ple pleasurable wow. effect. Now, queen g8 is unstoppable. And if you take, queen takes f8. So that's it. That would have ended the game. So sure, up desperately goes knight to d8, opening up a lifeline through to the king side if you do the same thing now that's actually a very clever move by Shirov because he picks off the seven knight with his queen and that knight and is trapped he attacks on f8 i did get to work with Shirov for a couple of days but i was already a gm 
And he was never sort of my long-term coach. So Kasparov says, okay, no problem. He takes the road. He has reestablished material equality while keeping all of the advantages of his position, including the knight on d5, dominance over the light squares, and now a passed pawn, and a horribly weakened black's king. So Kasparov now uses the main asset that has been created, which is the passed pawn, and he pushes it. Shirov responds in this last-ditch attempt to create problems with queen a3, which he seems to succeed in doing, because if Kasparov moves the bishop, well, Shirov could take, and he could put the rook behind the passed pawn. And black may still be worse, but now the knight is actually very, very close to finally activating itself. And something like this could easily happen, and white loses most of his advantage. Um, and this is a stage of the game in which a lot of people slip up. It's the stage where you've played a great positional game. Now you need to transition from general positional considerations to specific tactical action, and that often involves a tactical sacrifice, and a lot of people just aren't prepared for that. That was one of Kasparov's greatest... Yeah, this is much harder. ...to switch seamlessly between you know like if tactics. at my level if it's just like boom here's your position you're white win the game because i'm sure the computer evaluates white as winning uh and with like a especially with some kind of time crunch um it's not so easy <laughs> you know it's not so easy to finish this thing like kasparov and he goes queen f5 he simply abandons the bishop and he banks on his incredibly strong pieces to deliver uh the crushing attack and it's actually not that hard to calculate if queen takes d3 you go queen to d7, and you so know, we did spot that move. Alone here, if the knight moves, well, you have check on c8, and this is just checkmate, among other ways to checkmate. There is simply no defense if you play rook takes c3, queen d7, and now if you try to bring the queen back to a8, it's not hard to see that this is also, also a checkmate. I'm not using a computer here, so this is my own analysis. Um, so Shirov has to move his king to e8 in order to prevent the queen from accessing d7. So now Kasparov moves his bishop away to c4, where it actively joins the attack by x-raying f7. Shurov pesters it with rook c2, and now essentially Kasparov finds uh, wonder if not, not a difficult, that I spotted but a there. very elegant um, way to essentially end the game. He takes on h7. And uh, we'll get to that in a second. So first, I want to ask people, what is the final sequence of moves that basically ends the game here this is tactic queen g a check king d7 knight b6 already forks the rook and in a very fitting twist of irony white sacrificed in exchange and he ends the game and exchange up so shirov did not resign here he moved his king takes the rook now kaspar played another nice move rook a1 this just shows you his the guy's technique if you take the knight, he goes rook a7 check. This was and then the... he actually goes queen e8 check and picks the knight off of check and everything falls. Okay, so that's we calculated so that Shirov line. So goes queen d4, rook a3. Still the knight is untouchable. Bishop c1. And now a very nice move, knight e3, after which Shirov resigns. The knight completes its victory tour. If bishop takes a3, you have a fork on f5. Okay, the fork is on Back f5. Back with g6. The knight travels to d5. And the game is essentially over in a million different ways. Black's position collapses. Um, and sure, I've resigned after the move 93, move 30. Anyways, I uh, hope you guys enjoy this. I will be putting out more videos like this. And if you are interested in following my personal progress to 2000 ELO, I'm actually growing my beard until I reach that goal. I put out rapid games nearly every day. So if you want to check that out, here's a link to the video either below or above. And I'll see you in the next one.